Okay, so good afternoon. The plan for this hour and the half is to speak a little bit about styling and layout for the web, for what concern the front-end uh, development. So in particular, we will cover today a quite brief introduction to CSS and a framework that we are going to use during the course uh, that is named Bootstrap, that was realized in the beginning by Twitter, and it is a CSS and J JavaScript framework to allow you to use different pre-made components, different pre-made function methods, structure, graphical structure, layouts, just easy to, to use and ready to be used without realizing everything from scratch. So how many of you know anything about CSS? Okay, good. And Bootstrap? Okay. And do you know what a browser inspector is or the inspector in the browser is? Yes. No. Okay, so f let's start from that. You have a web browser the one that you like. This is Chrome, but you may also open Firefox or whatever you prefer. And then most of the browser, every browser, has in some menus or in this contextual menu, an um, inspect voice that open the browser inspector. The browser inspector allow you to, as the name say, inspect the content of any web page and also to show you the source code of the web page. So this is, for example, the source code of the home page of the Elite Research Group in which we have the course web page. So this is not really readable. This is quite a mess because this is how to generate it from a uh, tool from a content manager that is called Joomla. So typically when they, you use this tool, you don't have a clear uh, HTML and uh, uh, CSS and, and so on. It, moreover, it's optimized for caching and so on. But you can have a look of the source code of any website on the internet with this. And you can, well, have a look at this, click on the links, and see what is present in any link. And uh, you can also inspect hmm, line by line. Okay, I would like to know what is this. Uh, and so here it's, uh, here it's highlighted what HTML element is, his properties. And here in this side, you see also which style hmm, you have attached to that specific image, you can add some style. I don't know, for example, I can disable for the moment the color. So you see, no more color in the title or re-add again or change these properties. I can perform some operation here. Obviously, these are temporary operation. I can modify anything. I can, for example, say, okay, I don't want to see this because I don't like. So maybe we can just delete this. I deleted a portion of the web page. Obviously, this is temporary because if I just refresh this, it will come back, obviously, in the original form. But this is useful for at least two reasons. The first one is to understand how something on the web is working. Okay, I've, I really like that color. Let's see which color is. And so here you can read the exact code of the color to reuse, for example, that color in your website. And this is one thing. The other thing is in your personal website, maybe to get some experiment. Okay, I would like, I've written this styling element and I would like to 
perform this operation, but it doesn't work. So why doesn't work? So here you see your operation, why they applied, why not? And you can on the fly experiment with this new operation. So change something here, say, okay, now I like it. So you can copy and paste from here to uh, the, co the code in a uh, integrated in development environment like PyCharm or similar and realize all the modification in your website. So as a preview. Hmm? So this could be useful for experimenting in your website or to get information to understand how something is structured in any other website on the web. Then these could be more or less readable. It depends on the website that you have at the end. So I will use it quite a lot today to give you also some practical example. And the other things that I'm going to use is the, uh, the project that you realize on Thursday with Alberto in the classroom. So just uh, the, the exam manager. So I will run this and we will try to add some CSS uh, and styling element to this. So in Flask, obviously not to the app.py, uh, but to the index exam and well, login error if we want. So just to remind you, this is made in this way. So let me turn off this. Okay. Mm. So this is the website you made last time. You can log in. If I remember. Okay. Mm. And see the list of exam that you add so you got 30 in ambient intelligence congratulations and you got 25 in virtual reality that is a master degree course so maybe you are a little bit too early for that but this is just html you just realize this in html no style no colors no any specific any particular here you just one big image is there with a title and one line uh, under the image and a, but a link that is called the logout and very few other elements just the html of this and obviously if you inspect this uh, or better you look for the source code the page source you see the html that was generated starting from your python code so this is the resulting XML from your Python code. So there is the doc type, the HTML tag, the head with just the title and the char set that to be used, then a header of first level here that is called my, that contains as a text, my exams manager, an image that is stored in this server under the static folder and with a an image, image file that's called exams.jpg, then a paragraph that in this case say you are already authenticated, a link, and another link to go to logout, and then close the body of the page and close the HTML tag of the entire page. So this is what PyCharm generate from this. So PyCharm, as you imagine, replace this with just slash static slash exam.jpg. So replace any, let's say, Python-related variables argument with a real HTML code for the browser. But again, this is just HTML. This is the structure of the website. We would like to add something a little bit uh, more also beauty to see let's say so in the web this is a very long introduction to say in the web this part is standardized by the CSS 
CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheet. And it has, well, a uh, quite long story. It starts in 1996 with CSS1 as a W3C recommendation. W3C is the organization that standardized most of the uh, elements, standard documents on the web. Uh, CSS is standardized by W3C. Also, HTML is standardized by the same organization. Then in 2011, we got CSS2.1. So an evolution of CSS, because the web was changed a lot since 96 to 2011. Uh, probably Google was born around 1996, 1995, something like that. So before that year, you don't have Google. For sure, in 1996, you don't have YouTube, Facebook, all these element were not present in the web at the time so also the requirement also the connection you don't have uh, adsl you don't have the fiber connection to the to the internet in 1996 so your uh, the user has different required requirements you cannot put big images because it, it takes 10 minutes to download and see on your browser an image very big in 2011 things were a little bit better for reactiveness and so on. And so you have CSS 2.1 that adds some features. And then right now you have CSS 3, that is again an evolution of CSS 2. And as different st stages is not yet fully standardized, but is in the working draft and is basically used and implemented by every browser in, uh, in the world, so Chrome, Firefox, and so on. Obviously, you have some resources in the official uh, website. The w w3, w3.org is the uh, website for the w W3C organization. And the idea of the CSS is to get some style and to your web page that otherwise are black and white, basically. Uh, CSS is a language, it's not a programming language, it's a, let's say, declarative language that is based on rules. A rule so, is a statement about one stylistic aspect of one or more HTML element, and a style sheet is a set of these rules that apply to a given HTML document. So, for example, to our index dot html so the rule is composed by uh, two elements basically you have a selector and then you have a, a, a graph open here and at the end a closed graph and then you have a couple of uh, properties and value that are called declaration in css you have at least one selector and at least one declaration to have a real a valid rule so here you can have a minimum uh, declaration rules could be h1 color blue mm? this is something that you can have in addition but uh, a rule could stop here and it is valid at minimum that point so what this what this rule did so first of all it say i only apply to the element whose tag is h1 mm? so in our example here, let's see the source code, maybe. A rule like that only apply to this line because this is the only element in this page that has the H1 tag. And then what to say, to that element highlighted with H1, Perform two operation. The first one is change the color, or better, set the color to that line to blue, and change the font size to that element to 12 pixels. Just two operation. So if we try, we can try here. So I will do it for now uh, from the, the inspector. So I would inspect this 
that is our H1. So here is highlighted in this area, and here on the side I can write that H1, okay, the element style selected is, for example, color blue and font size 12 pixel. So uh, you see what happens. First, declaration change the color to blue, and the second declaration, in this case, reduced the size of the font of the title to 12, mm -hmm. instead of the original uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, you can say, okay, I don't want blue, I would, would like to have this uh, red, for example, and that's it. You change it, and and it becomes red. So obviously, as I said before, this is just temporary. If I refresh this page, it goes back to black and the original font, and I lose everything here in this inspector. But just to, to, to understand how it works. So there are a series of rules that apply to elements. And how these elements apply, so you have to understand that the HTML page is uh, typically structured as a tree. So the first element, as you saw also here, no. The first element is HTML. Inside HTML, you have at least two sub-categories, sub-tags. The first one is head. So the HTML is open here and is closed here at the end. The head open here and closed here. And then, uh, let's say, brother of the head is the body tag that open there and closed there. So body and head are contained inside HTML. So these are, let's say, a tree. So you have the first element, the HTML, and you see it has two on. The first one is head that may have other elements inside, and the second one is the body that has any other elements inside. So in this example, the body has another tag inside that's called div. Inside this div, there are other two tags called div, again, uh, identified by the tag name that is div. Inside this first div, you have a table. Inside the table, you have different row, different column. And in the other div, you have a link, a sentence in uh, cursive, another link, and so on and so on and so on. So this is just a tree in which you have some elements included in other elements that maybe have other elements included and so on and so on. So you build this uh, structure of container one in the other. And in CSS, that rule that we have seen are inherited along the tree. So you may apply a rule here that apply to HTML and this rule automatically apply to everything that is under HTML. So basically to everything. So if you say that anything in HTML has color red, all the text in your page will become red. If you say that instead this H1 here, this H1 here is red, only this H1 here will become red. If you apply separate rule, if you have two rules in conflict, let's say I would like all the text under HTML red, and I would like to test the text under H1 blue. So we change the color to say the same things that is the text in the page. The most specific rule always win. So. In this case, in the example, the H1 rules win over the most general HTML rule. 
So for example, if we say that the body, so everything under body should have the green color, you will put everything green here in the P, in H1, in this UL, the stain for um, unordered list that has two items, list item, LE. So everything becomes green. And then I say, okay, I would like instead the H1 become red. And what happens here that everything remains green, but this will become red. So the most specific one win over the generic rule, always. And in CSS, you have different level of styles. Uh, that, that is also the reason why we, we call it cascading style sheet, uh, in the meaning that style sheet could be put in cascade, one for the other. So a document can include more than one style sheet if you want and also at different level hmm? with this priority so the first style that you have is the browser style then you have an optional user style that is not the user that is seeing your website not you as a creator of the website but the user that is probably set up is uh, or her uh, computer to behave in a certain way in the web browser then you have your style the author style the website creator style that could be of two types external and embedded that basically works the same way just it's just different how do you um, define that and then in the end you have inline style so what is the browser style basically if I go back here and inspect this, so we know that here we don't have any applied CSS rule. It's just blank HTML without any styling. But if we inspect this element, we see, for example, that for H1 here, we have some properties. These are not properties that you give to your web page because here we don't have any rule these are the what chrome called the user agent style sheet so for h1 the browser say for example that it has a font size a specific font size it has for example that the weight is bold so the, uh, h1 is automatically a bold in text it's not plain in text and that has some margin before, after, up and down, and so on. And these are default browser style that you have in any case, even if you don't define anything. These are implemented to just give you some idea on what element is on the screen. So for example, a H1 header, so the header of first level should be bigger than the header of second level, the header of third level, than the paragraph text. And so the, the browser by default put that text bigger and bolder than normal text like the other here. Or for example, the link, the link is underlined. And this is again, the default style of the browser that give you this first style element uh, then you have the user defined style that in chrome it's not possible without using a external plugin but it typically is not made but maybe uh, with some accessibility tool for people with some visual impairment for example they could set up some fonts or they could uh, uh, enlarge me the minimum value of this h1 for example because it's maybe too small for for them if they want and then you have the author style the website creator style your style that could be again of two types external and embedded or the inline style also the inline style is the author style so the inline style is basically 
defined directly in the HTML. So if you want to add the red color as before to this H1, we just can add a inline style. If you type style, you can write CSS rule over there. And so we can say that color colon red, semicolon. So we define inline that the text under that specific H1, only that specific H1 level, tag, is colored in red. And this is in line. This is, to be very clear, very bad. So please keep the inline uh, definition of style. Never do the line definition of style as a rule of thumb. But it's better the external. It's the preferred way of adding CSS to a web page, web page so that you can maintain the structure of the page, the HTML, separate from the style of the page that you want to assign to that specific page. Here, it's instead a mess because you put together everything. But just to exemplify, this is valid for CSS. So if we rerun this, and go here and refresh, we can see that right now that H1 is red because I had this uh, rule in the code. And obviously you can also inspect this as before and see that this H1 right now has a color red definition here that I don't put inside, but it was defined by the website, the, the code here. And this is the inline style. Then you have the external. The external is <coughs> a separate file, just a separate file that you put in your website that typically is called style.css or something very close to this. And that contains all the rules all the CSS rule that you would like to apply to that. So for example, we can have a style.css file, just text file with H1, with a given font size of 17 pixel, a given font family in a given color. And then we can define, for example, the H level two, the header second level, which has a font size bigger than the previous one, that is not totally fine, with a different a font family and a different color. And this is possible, obviously, mm, uh, by definition, the semantic definition of H2 should be that the header second level is smaller than the header first level. So this change of size is not, is allowed technically, is not very good in practice, but you can do this, obviously. And this is a separate file on your computer. And you have then to link your HTML page to this very specific file with the link tag. So if you put a link tag in your head of the web page and say that the, that link is a style sheet with a certain type that is text CSS and you give the URL, the, the name of the URL of that file, you automatically include all the definition in your uh, web page. The other style, yes, there is also an alternative method instead of writing the link that is opening a style tag and writing at import URL, the name of the style sheet, but it's just an alternative. Typically the, the first one is, is used. And then we have the embedded style that basically say, okay, I don't have a different CSS file. I don't have line by line the definition of each element in line, but I create a style tag somewhere in the head of the web page and inside this tag, this container, I will put every rules over there. So the rules are physically in one place in the HTML page. Yeah, the online style, we, we already saw that. So. In our project, let me delete this. So 
I will refresh this just to check that everything is fine. Mm. We can, for example, so if we want uh, to add a uh, embedded style sheet, we can write here style, and here we can write the CSS code, all the rules, or we can add a file. So in Flask, since the CSS is a static file text, like let's say an image, you have to put this file in the static folder of your project. So in the static folder, we can create a new file. Then we can call it style.css. And here we can write, for example, h1 color red, for example. And then we can say, for example, p uh, font family let's see if we say Arial Arial sorry for example so let's set up a color for the every h1 element in our page and a font family that is Arial for every paragraph in our page. So we can save this and go to the index and say, okay, here I would like to add a link. So let's copy and paste from here, if possible. It's not possible, okay. Uh, so ring rel style sheet uh, href uh, static uh, this way hmm. file name is called style.css hmm. so I, i'm using uh, the flask way of intercepting uh, files in the setting folder so that if we move the setting folder rename the setting folder we don't have to edit this code but flask automatically get the url for that folder and place the right url in the right place for you hopefully then we can restart this and check if everything work that's it so you see that the h1 is red again and that we change the font of this paragraph here and only in this page if we go in the exam page you see that the font is and the header of first level is black and the font is the times new normal the define times new normal font and then we come back to the home page and we get the the edit and here if you want in the it's the same but we can also open here so here you see that now you have this link style sheet with a specific URL that you can click on it and also see the code the CSS code the CSS rule that you have written here So this is, just to, to sum up, CSS is made by rules. You can have multiple rules uh, with multiple elements uh, referring to specific tag in three different ways. Internal, um, external style with a link, embedded style by including directly the CSS in your HTML pages or inline, so changing line by line of your html code hmm. properties uh, css has as you imagine a lot of properties we just seen color that change the color of a text but you can also have uh, the, well text we change the font of a text the default browser style sheet change the bold or the style of the text make it bold 
then you have uh, transformation animation list effects images margin and so on so a lot of properties for example for what concern color you have the color the property color the one that we used that come from css version one and then for example in css version three you also have an opacity hmm? so uh, you can set with the same color main property the opacity level for an element hmm? so more or less transparent that element and here in this link let's open just one browser per time you see all the properties that css has so starting from alignment i have like left center right animation delay direction uh, background background color background image so not just an image on your web page but on the background of your uh, content or your container border i do want an image with a border a black thick border or not for example with style color only in the top only on the bottom only on the left you can really imagine everything here uh, font family to change the family of font okay we set it everything to arial but you can also set it to very specific font that you may be downloaded from the internet or there are available on the internet for example there is the google font projects that allow you to get let, let's see this one to get this font here and use it in your web page and they give you the a link like a style sheet to get that font in your web application without downloading the font but directly getting the font from this website and then you inside your uh, your page you can say okay i want every all the text here in the roboto or what is called uh, font family so not arial not times new roman font that are for sure available on the user computer but you can also use different font that maybe a person doesn't have because this is not a standard font for operating system on normal people computer and also notice that for for what concern fonts i here defined two elements the first one is the arial font and the second element is just a family of font in that case serif that is please apply to the paragraph the arial font if the user that is navigating the website doesn't have the arial font on its computer that is quite improbable but anyway if doesn't have if she doesn't have this font just use a serif font a font with serif family on the computer no matter which just one of them so you have a backup uh, font for your website if you want and then you can also add a third option a fourth option and so on uh, with the most general that should be in the end for, for what concern fonts but okay. so again here you have this very long list of properties you don't have to learn everything everyone by memory fortunately uh, as you have seen uh, PyCharm here suggests you a series of operations valid operations so for example if I type C and say call you see color and you can select this PyCharm give you okay this is from CSS1 the, the top one is for CSS3 and so you can use it and just select this and then it suggests okay which color do you want to to use and you can select the color and so on so it has a simplifier for you to get your work with CSS done 
back to the slide. So right now we have just selected to be applied a style a given tag. In our example, we say, okay, the H1 tag should have these properties and the P tag should have these other properties. This identifier that we called it before is also called selector. And you can have three main types of selector. We have just seen the first one, that is the tag. We have the here we have the h1 where is here the h1 tag minor h1 greater than major and here in the css code we just write h1 the name of the tag same things for the p for the paragraph the tag is named minor p major and this is the first selector in the html you have minor name of the tag major and in css you select which property to apply to that specific tag with just calling by its name so h1 p and so on then you have other two types of main selector the first one is called class and the second one is called id hmm? the class in the HTML code is identified by a properties that is called class and a name. And this name here, this CC, is up to you. You don't have a fixed. Okay, in a framework, if you're using a framework, there are some predefined classes, but you can create your own classes here. And in the other, in CSS, you have to say dot the name of the class to apply all the properties to that classes, to the element with that class is associated. And the third one is called ID as an identifier and works uh, in textual way like before. So you have to define a property that is called ID, a name that you define, and in the CSS you write hash and the name you define. So you can have a class, uh, let's say, beauty box and an id let's say copyright the difference between these two so people that know css which are the difference between a class and id an id is an identifier as as the name identifier mean it must be present only one time per page the browser did expect that in your page only one ID of a given type exists. So if you have an ID that's called the copyright in the page must be present only one time, that is maybe in the copyright footer, for example, while a class can be repeated any, every time you want, not just one time. So what the difference between these let's say this couple in the end of the first one is that the first one identify an element i would like to get this style for every p element in the page no matter which is the content of this the other two allow you to better specify which element maybe i would like to change the color to all to some p elements and to some header of level three but the same color and so i can create a class and apply this class to either some p and some uh, headers for example and identifier instead should be applied one, just one time so maybe one p statement one p element as the identifier the id not every element in the in the page and this three selector could be combined in very different way so for example you could say okay second line this is what we did right now we have we would like to have some change of style for all the div tag okay div is just a tag like h1 right now let's imagine when i say div let's imagine a tag a generic tag so i would like to change the color or everything that is 
a tag as tag div as tag h1 then you can say okay third line i would like to change the color for example of every element that are contained inside that div so maybe in that div there are three paragraph and an header of level six and an image and uh, a link i would like to change that property to everything that is inside this container or i could say okay i don't want to change everything inside the container i would like to change only the given span so another tag a given a tag inside a bigger a bigger container or i would like to apply this rule not to to every div and to every tag in the page even if they are not one inside the other or other two example uh, i would like to apply this rule to all the span with a parent so a direct pattern uh, a direct parent div or only when line after only when the span is preceded by one div not by other element so you can combine this and realize very precise if you want application of this style same things apply for classes for example you can say div.class i would like to apply this style to all the the tag the container that are with tag div but only if they have this specific class applied so not just every div but just that every div which this class a and so on every div with this specific id uh, or you can move from things a little bit more complex okay i would like to apply this only in the first child of the element or only if the element is active or is hover with a mouse over the, the text and so on so for example we can here try to define an h1 hover and let's say the color green if we rerun this the output should be that should be yeah okay should be that when i move my mouse over that i will look after why it doesn't working uh, over that the color change become gray and so on so a lot of selector to do different things so for again another example let's say that i would like to let's pray take this so for example let's add here a paragraph let's say a copyright um, 2019 so here we can add an id that's called the copyright and in the style sheet we can say copyright i don't know uh, let's say again color green he doesn't like the color today I write it in the right way. Copyright. Yes. So let's try again. Okay. It's just some probably caching in the browser. So you see, 
maybe not. But right now we have this copyright, it is green. And I just apply it to the, uh, this tag. So if I come here and, for example, delete this ID, let's say that I just make an error instead of writing copyright, I, I write copyright without the I, uh, and rerun this, we should see that obviously it doesn't get the color anymore because there is no ID associated to that, just get the fonts because it's a P element, a P tag. Copyright. Okay. So you can also, as I said before, apply this selector, the, the second column of the previous slides. So for example, you can say, okay, I would like to have a link associated to every A element in blue. Or, and then when this element is visited, so when the user clicked at least one time on that link, I would like to make it green. And then if the mouse is over that link, I would like to have it red again. So when it's never clicked blue, when it's clicked one time is green, and when I move the mouse over is red. And then if I click it, it becomes green. If I move the mouse, it comes back blue. And these are all selector. Or I can also say that in a table row, so in a row of a table, you can say when I put the mouse over the row, I would like that the background color of that specific row is red. Otherwise it's white by default and so on. So, Right now, you have seen that you have a series of elements, tag. Each of these elements has, in reality, a, let's say, semantic meaning. So, for example, the header, as I said before, the header of first level is, should be one in the page and should be bigger and stronger than the header of second level because it's, the second level is a second level header, not the first one. Or that you have, for example, the for a list, you have the UL, OL, and DL. And you should use the first one when you want a not ordered list, while if you want an ordered list, you should use the second one. You can put it element strong, bold, or in cursive, so EM. You can block quote, cite, so appear like a citation in your web page. You can say, okay, this, this portion of the web page, it contains some code. So you have a code tag and so on. These are, let's say, the standard tag. You would then have, as we said before, the ID and class properties to be applied to these tags. And as just hinted before, you also have the other two types of tags that are defined. The first one is div and the second one is span. Div stands for division, it's just a container to put together block level elements. And so it provides a way, an additional way, to group, to divide the element in different portion. Obviously, it is to be used only if it is necessary and not redundant. So, for example, in the first, in, in the first case, you have a, D, a div and that contains just an, a not ordered list. And so, in that case, probably the div could be skipped because you just have the list and the list is enough to contain all this content. The other element is the span that use again to group element together but in line. So you want for example to identify or to give some style for example to a date. So inside a paragraph you put a span with class date before March 22, uh, 2005, for example, or around the author of the element to give you, a, let's say, a semantic meaning of some portion of text in this case. And so, you, for example, you can add some style on every author in the page, maybe by changing the color or, so, or, or, or something like that. Then, 
Furthermore, HTML5, that is the version that we are using right now, adds other semantic tags with respect to before. It adds a header, so not the header that contains the declaration, but just a header, like an header on a web page. Then it adds a type, a tag that's called nav, that is thought to contain the navigation of the website. Then it defines an aside, a column, a lateral column, and two other sections, a section, a block called section, and a block called article to contain articles or a set of articles. The first one, a set of articles, and the second one, just one article in a page. So like, for example, a blog post could be in an article. And then is the dual of header is the footer. So these are new semantic tag that must be, or better, if they are present, they are present inside the body tag of the HTML file. Then a basic concept of CSS is the box model. The box model indicate how the elements are displayed and how they interact with each other. So every element on an HTML page is for a browser, for CSS, considered to be a rectangular box. This rectangular box has three, four, sorry, four uh, elements. The first one is the content area, where you put your text, where you put your image, where you put your form, whatever. Then, around the content area, you have the padding. The padding can be seen as a, also an internal margin, in the meaning that it expands the area of the content and it maintains, for example, the same color of the content area. So if the content area is a background in red, the padding is an extension of this content area without text, without the images, in the same red color. Then you have, hmm? then you have a border that is again around the padding and the content and is affected again by the background color of the box. And finally, you have the margin that clears the area around the border and the margin does not have a background color. You cannot set a background color on the margin and it's completely transparent and is used typically to distanciate element in the web page. This same box model is also reported here in the bottom of this uh, inspector. You see there is the content, this web page has a content on around 2,000 pixel, uh, this element selected here. It has a padding. Right now it, does, it doesn't have any padding. It doesn't have any border, this element, and it has a margin of 16 pixel, according to the default style, because we didn't set up any of these properties. But these properties could be set up in CSS, like the color and the other parameters. So, for example, uh, this is defined a width inside of the content area, a padding of five pixels every side. You can also define the padding on the top, on the bottom, on the left, on the right, separately, if you want. Same thing as a margin, no border here. And the total size of this container is 70 plus 5 plus 5 plus 10 plus 10 because on the, the side you have double padding, you have to count the two times the padding in the margin for a total 100 pixels. This is the space that the element contain, occupy in the web page. So right now we have seen uh, elements that are contained in this, in this box and that could be change color, size, uh, background color, fonts and so on. This element could also be positioned in the page according to, let's say, three, um, some criteria. Okay. Uh, that are here. Okay, 
by default they use the static criteria in vertical with a predefined browser defined spaces then you have a box positioning relative absolute of fixing relative is an offset value according to a specific position so for example you can have a, a box that is 20 pixel on the bottom and 20 pixel on the right inside the a side or you can have a, a relative position 100 pixel on the top corner of the web page and 100 pixel on the left notice that in general in, in programming in graphical interfaces the the coordinates are the zero zero coordinates are always in the top left board uh, angle so here is zero zero typically so here it could be the zero zero coordinate the of the aside um, structure They could then this could be relative or they also be absolute let's say i don't care the relative position or watch of the other i would like to put this here and i don't care if the overlap something or it's da uh, behind something else i would like to put it here no matter of uh, this positioning is for for us i, I would don't want to to give too much in depth for this partially for the time but also partially because f with the with a framework like bootstrap most of this is basically mainly solved by the framework that uh, if you use the element and the classes provided by the framework to get started uh, they it already take care of this positioning for you so these are example this is the relative position so you see one box is there the third box is here and you position relative the third one and this should be moved obviously uh, this is absolute so it doesn't have the space for containing the second box you just put the second box on the top of the other two without caring about anything and then an important properties other two important properties that are typically used for images and text is the floating of a box so a box could be floated on the left on the right and so it could be aligned on the left or line on the right with the float left float right properties in css and the other property that's interesting in the display properties that is written this way that allow you to display or not a given box a given element on the page so if you say okay i would like to display none a div with class uh, uh, whatever you will hide in the web page all the div with that specific class and this is made in CSS you can you will see that for example with JavaScript you can control these properties automatically so make things appear and disappear if you need okay so this is CSS in general basically are a set of rules again that apply to this tag that are contained in this box with this tool to not uh, write everything from scratch all the positioning the grid i need an element on the left i need three columns in my web page two columns four columns an element on the top one another in the bottom some frameworks exist that you can directly use in your code we are typically using bootstrap here that is an open source css and javascript framework that allow applying uh, let's say modern style also responsive so you can have a web page that appears in a, one way on your computer and on your smartphone it appears properly scaled down it was uh, developed by twitter and um, it has a simplified layout model based on grid and containers gi by giving you specific classes and it also takes care of specific cross-browser issues so maybe something that on internet explorer doesn't work but work on chrome's and doesn't work on firefox so works differently in other browser it tried to take care of this automatically 
Uh, there are currently two versions of Bootstrap, bo Bootstrap version 3 and Bootstrap version 4. We, as depicted here, we will not use Bootstrap 4, but we will use Bootstrap 3.3.7, that is one of the latest versions of Bootstrap 3, for two reasons mainly. The first one is that there is a Flask extension for Bootstrap 3, so with just a couple lines you get everything from Bootstrap in your Flask application. And the second one is that Bootstrap 3 is easier to learn, to be learned with respect to Bootstrap 4. Bootstrap, Bootstrap 4 is modular, is very well done, but it's quite complex to get started with it. Instead, Bootstrap 3 is simpler to get started. It also has simple structure to be applied. So we will stick with Bootstrap 3 for now. Uh, Bootstrap is based on CSS classes, only CSS classes and each class apply one let's say effect and various classes could be combined together in the uh, class properties in a tag and as a lot of standard components a standard classes is responsive as uh, as i said to you before so it has a website obviously in which you can for example see okay how to get started well to get started, you have to just copy and paste without using any extension uh, like Bootstrap Flask, Flask Bootstrap. These in, at the beginning, in the head of your HTML uh, page, and from that moment on, that page is importing ele every element of Bootstrap. Which are these elements? Well, a lot. So, for example, it defines where is here? A grid system so you can say okay I would like to have 12 columns in my web page I can I would like to have two columns of the same size I can I would like to have one column on the left bigger than the other yes you can for example an eight a column that span eight and the other the span four in bootstrap the sum should be 12 8 plus 4, or you can have 3 column 4, 4, 4, or 2 column 6 and 6, or any combination of these, and it defines how many columns you may have in your, in your web page and give you a structure also horizontally, not only vertically in your code. So, and how do you apply this? After each image on the website of Bootstrap, you have an example. So, for example, if you want to have let's say two column, same size, you have a div that has a class that's called the row because identify a given row of your page and inside this row that could be uh, height enough as you want, high enough as you want, you have to define other two divs with a class that is called md6 column medium dimension 6 and inside this div you can put whatever you want you can put some text you can put some paragraph you can put another div you can put whatever you want and it has also a series of component so you have some yes glyphs and you can also have some button you want a button big with a star a small star you would like to have a drop down to select like a menu or a drop up that opens on the top you can align element on the right on the on the top you can have divider uh, group of button you can change also size uh, color of buttons you can run red color red buttons white yellow blue whatever color so you can personalize automatically and with an example this is the example of a d that exact line over there so if you cop copy and paste this in your code you will recreate this element in above and, and so on so and here you have just a full documentation of everything that bootstrap can do with again an example before to get started 
you have to go to the top and there is a getting started and they say okay you have to copy and paste this as i said before and then skip all of this and uh, they provide you a basic template to show you uh, an example so you can for example copy and paste this body here and see what happens in your uh, in your code and then there are also some other example we will use this not this example this framework in our example in classroom when we after the rest uh, apis and so we will use this so for example they define a navigation bar on the top that could be black or white as you choose just change a property in your html file tables and so on um, this is basically what i show you in the web page so okay uh, we can try to add this in our project so let's try to add this in our head I just copy and paste that notice notice that since style sheets are cascading i can have multiple style sheet the first one is the one that i defined and then i can put the the one of bootstrap uh, the one of bootstrap in this way overwrite my definition because they are declared after my uh, definition of style sheet if i want to overwrite some definition partially or totally some definition of bootstrap i can move the line of my style.css on the bottom after the definition of css because for example bootstrap i can define h1 with color red and size 20 i don't want the color red so but i like the, the size of 20 so i can just say h1 color green and to override just the property color of bootstrap not everything just the property that it would like to override so this is in this way then i can put here a div with class container that is the basic class in bootstrap and close this here and let's see if something change already okay okay you see we just have everything in the middle of the screen before it wasn't uh, and we also change the font is not anymore in Arial because bootstrap over overwrite my definition of style sheet because it was applied after and uh, it also changed this blue color here and by default links are not underlined anymore this is something that bootstrap give you for free let's say and it overrides the standard definition of the browser obviously the green in copyright remains because bootstrap doesn't define an id that is called copyright because something that i defined by myself here and so here you have this web page that is centered and you can in this way split in column some portion with our put a row inside with some column put a row with just one column like this uh, make this fluid and by default this should also be scaled not not really because probably it's container fluid for mobile yes more or less so in this mobile visualization these things to be 
let's say a Galaxy S5. So in a Galaxy S5, you see our web page in this way, scaled down, but everything is in the uh, in the page is visible, and Bootstrap provide you with this column MD6 and so on. They can also be put automatically will be put one under the other just to give you a responsive view of this if you want same things apply for navigation and so on and you can also rotate the phone if you want okay so this basically uh, last thing that's two things, sorry. The, so this is how to apply Bootstrap from scratch with the uh, Flask Bootstrap uh, extension. We will just avoid to write these, all these basically, and we'll just include in our Python code this extension and it will give you all this code automatically inserted in every page of your application. So this is, was only applied to the index. If I would like to have the same context in the exam, I, or the exam page, I need to copy and paste this in the other HTML pages and again, again, for each pages by hand, copying and paste. The Flask extension give you this automatically and give you also some other, uh, well, no, that, that one is Flask instead. So Flask could also give you some other feature that we will see later on uh, this week or next one uh, you will see later on this week or in the next one uh, last things and then you can go in la dispe is that for thursday before the lecture of thursday you should uh, read a new reading that is an introduction to the HTTP protocol and to the JSON text format uh, because you will start speaking with, uh, about REST, REST server with Flask. And so there are just two links over the, here, a tutorial on how the HTTP protocol works, which verb that are very important for the REST part, the HTTP verb. So get, post, put, update and delete basically and a JSON tutorial that show you how it's structured a JSON file that is just a exchange file, just text, nothing really complex, just text in a specific format, very similar to um, JavaScript. And this link has four in five important section, overview that to give you an introduction, syntax, but is really, really simple. The syntax or data types are an object where it will be very short and especially JSON with Python, because Python is able to create a JSON file and to read automatically a JSON file without installing everything, anything for this. Okay, so this close this lecture and uh, Alberto is waiting for you in La Dispe and having a good uh, evening. And if you have a question, I'm still here for a while.